Okay, our second talk, and actually the remainder of the invited talks, will be actually from alumni from the SSGF program. So the honor now is to introduce Anna Erickson, who is an assistant professor at Georgia Institute of Technology from November of 2012 to the current time. Um, speaking with Anna earlier this year, it was amazing to me how many students she has. So she's been very active in trying to get the next generation involved, too, through the University of Professor. She has a Bachelor of Science from Oregon State, and then her Master's and PhD are from MIT. Her primary focus, as you're going to see in the talk, and we, okay, we do have it up, is on antineutrino, nuclear reactor type of dynamics, specifically interested to advanced detector design, safety, non-proliferation concerns, things that are truly in alignment with the NNSA mission, and actually show how people not only can help the labs by working, but can help the labs by finding the next generations. So, Anna. Thank you, Brad. You guys can hear me? So thank you for that interesting introduction. Uh, I was asked to speak here as a both invited talk and an alum. So I figured I'm going to start my uh, alum talk with giving you a little bit of how I ended up there. Uh, I don't think that's very common for the graduates of SSGF to end up in academia. Uh, more commonly, they end up at the national labs aligned with the primary mission of uh, SSGF program. Well, I, I spent my time in Lawrence Livermore after I graduated from MIT. I went to Livermore as a postdoc, and I worked on antineutrino physics. And one thing that they brought me to do is advanced detectors. However, when they learned about my background in nuclear reactors, which was both bachelor's and MS, they said, we need someone to do real modeling and not approximate the reactor as a point source, but rather understanding how the reactor behaves as a source of neutrinos for a variety of different problems including neutrino physics, uh, looking for the sterile neutrino, but also non-proliferation and uh, safeguards. So when I left Livermore in November 2012, which coincided uh, with the closing of San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, which hosted our experiment in the neutrinos, I formed a very interesting laboratory, which I was told that it's two directions that are too perpendicular to each other. One focused on advanced react analysis and the other focused on advanced detector. And it worked out quite well, actually, because we tackled the problems that are quite unique to nuclear non-proliferation and saying, how do you actually understand where the material comes from and its transition through multiple stages? But how do you also detect things? So we tackle things such as looking at the source of the nuclear materials, uh, uh, in addition to enrichment and um, uh, enrichment capabilities, the reactors, as we know, can be a great source of uh, plutonium, and it can be made quite clean. You just need to know how to do that. And I think North Korea example showed us that sometimes we think countries up to something, and then turns out to be no good. So how do we know what people are up to? So we need to know the source, but we also need to know the detector response. So in my group, we look at both. We look at the computational analysis, and we uh, uh, model both uh, nuclear reactors as well as detectors with a variety of codes. The reactor is the primary focus. What we see here is a detailed model of the HIFR that we adopted from Oak Ridge for some of the antineutrino work. But we also do quite a bit of experimental work. In fact, we were the first laboratory in Georgia Tech to move on to fully digital data acquisition system and taken full advantage of doing that as uh, uh, being the younger generation there. We were able to transition very smoothly to nothing but digital, so the NIMBUXs that you may be familiar with, like banned 100% from our lab and replaced with uh, gain digital equipment. So... One of the culminations of our reactor detector uh, project was an understanding of uh, nuclear material response to a number of different things. And uh, we formed NSF DNDO sponsored center with MIT and Penn State to uh, look at the nuclear uh, materials, special nuclear materials in transit, in particular shielded. And how do you identify whether there's a nuclear material or not? There's a special challenge when material is shielded you don't really get much uh, penetrating through it, even if you induce it using active interrogation. So we're coming up with the methods of uh, solving that challenge, and that's 
the one thing that uh, we're very active, that, that area of active interrogation and materials modeling uh, detectors, both modeling and experimental work. But the majority of the talk today will be focused on anti-neutrinos. This is an NSA-related uh, meeting, and NSA actually spent a lot of money on anti-neutrinos. There were a number of projects that I worked with, um, and then I say in particular an A22 office when I was a postdoc related to using anti-neutrinos for things like PMDA, plutonium management disposition agreement between the U.S. and Russia. How do you verify, verify that agreement using something as interesting and weird as neutrinos? And perhaps you've heard about the Watchman project, uh, which launched a few years ago with Livermore in the lead and the... Um, Final outcome is uncertain at, at this point. We don't know what happens to this project, but they put a lot of effort into understanding how uh, very large anti-neutrino detectors can be used to monitor what happens in the world on a global scale in terms of clandestine reactor facilities. So one thing that uh, uh, people in nuclear industry don't appreciate is once you move outside of the United States, which, by the way, United States is not under the IAEA safeguards. Once you move outside of the United States, interesting things can happen with reactors, and we've witnessed that before. A number of countries uh, want to develop nuclear capabilities. However, we don't want them to for a number of reasons, or we want to verify and monitor at all times. So at this moment, over 45 countries, both developing and sophisticated economies, are looking into... Uh, increasing or pursuing nuclear capabilities, 45 countries. And that's the one of the latest numbers. And why are people looking at nuclear power? Well, there's a number of reasons. Most of them uh, are good reasons, economics, and also the energy consumption that keeps growing up. Some of them are not so good, as we know, the, the recent developments with Iran. So... At this moment, there are 60 new reactors under construction in 13 countries and 160 planned constructions. Countries, some of the countries include uh, United Arab Emirates, Vietnam, and Jordan. And the interesting um, trend is uh, a lot of countries are looking at uh, what we call Generation 3 Plus design, which is advanced version of what we have in this country of light water reactors. But not all of them. Some of them are looking at fast reactors. And if, if uh, we don't have fast reactors in this country because we decided that it's much more economical to go light water reactors. But why would be fast reactors of interest? There are a number of reasons uh, and why we don't like the construction of fast reactors. They're very good at breeding special nuclear material in shorter periods of time with much cleaner outcome. But... Uh, current DOE strategy is to pursue Gen 4 reactors, including the FAST, and one of the uh, new outcomes of the uh, strategy is to make those reactors proliferation resistant and um, more, uh, remember the word they use, safeguardability should be a big factor. I don't know if that's a real word, but that's what I've heard. So a number of examples now, uh, what's under development in this country, General Atomics and uh, Terra Power, uh, part of the intellectual ventures, are all charging ahead with the uh, new advanced reactors that uh, they're trying to disseminate around the world, in particular to China. Uh, the other aspect of uh, uh, monitoring and verification is the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation and Nuclear Weapons. This cannot be understated because uh, anytime there is a talk about nuclear power and increasing nuclear power, what are we going to do to our um, uh, uh, verification probability? So the treaty, what does it do? It recognizes that there are five nuclear states that are allowed to have nuclear weapons and also separates them from the rest of the states that should not be having nuclear weapons, but also points out that disarmament should be on its way. That's uh, uh, PMDA agreement came as part of the disarmament uh, point of the non-proliferation treaty. But it also allows the nuclear power for the peaceful use. So where do we stand in this verification? Um, disarmament, the PMDA between the U.S. and Russia, what's the big problem with that? Well, neither country ha is under IA safeguards, and neither country wants 
uh, to have another country to come to their facilities and verify things. There are obvious reasons for that. And how do you do that? So neutrino verification came into play from this reason. We want the transparency. We want to understand uh, that the material is being disposed and it's not being um, reused in a nuclear weapon production. But we don't want to be present on site. Uh, for the anti-neutrinos, they, we don't have to be very close to the reactor itself. In fact, the detector can be placed quite a bit far away from the reactor, and it depends on the size of the detector, how far away you can go. And what we can do with that detector is do two things that are characteristics of ideal safeguard data, is real-time monitoring what happens to the core. We can see on and off. We can also uh, see what happens to the fuel as it evolves through the fuel cycle. It's also 100% reliable compared to the other methods that are currently being employed, such as the uh, stamps and uh, power measurements used in the secondary cycle, because we don't depend on people telling us what's going on there. So to summarize uh, why we're looking at the antineutrinos, the fast reactors and also the verification of the various agreements that are around the world that require the transparency um, and uh, require the transparency but not allowing us to be there to verify that transparency, that's a huge problem. So we use the elusive particles to not to be present at the site however, to still watch every activity that goes on. So what we're interested in uh, three things, uncertainty from the reactor core, because as we heard from Paul's talk, uncertainty is a big part of uh, both the source and also the detector part. Right? So in our case, the reactor core is the source of antineutrinos, which feeds the uncertainty into the detector. And antineutrino yields, uh, so my, my talk is focused on this point today, Antineutrino yields have been measured for a variety of uh, isotopes. However, uh, the yields change as we go from um, different spectrum reactors. So if we look at the fast reactor, the yields are quite different than for the thermal reactors. So we want to understand the effects of that. And it's never been measured for the fast reactor. There is no such thing as experimental data. So we have to extrapolate our knowledge of the thermal reactor uh, spectrum to the fast and also understand how we can fold in those uh, uncertainties. Diversion scenarios and associated errors. This is just like a what if uh, talk, right? Uh, what we heard in the previous talk. We don't know what's going to happen, uh, but there is some probability of things that may be happening. So the probability may be very low at this moment, but as we learned uh, with a number of examples, it can become very high and escalate very rapidly. So how do we, how do we get um, from point of just seeing things to the what's really happening in the core? And air reduction through observation approach. What does it mean? Well, I already said that sometimes we have no choice and we don't know the antineutrino yield. Well, we can calculate it computationally, which we have done. However, uh, experimental measurements are still required. So air reduction through observation is placing the detector near a, a reactor and then reducing the errors from both uncertainties in the reactor core and the antineutrino yield by just simply observing and correlating that with our understanding of what the core uh, output should be like. So when I started in uh, uh, Livermore with the SOMS project, this is a good example to start with, we worked on San Onofre generating station. That's a light water reactor. And the goal of this project was to implement a small-scale detector which you see here, this is a one-ton uh, liquid scintillator detector, positioned near the core. Here's, here's the reactor uh, cores right here. So we were in the tandem gallery about 25 meters away from the core. And then see what we can see. With, uh, a pro at that time, we had no knowledge of the fuel cycle evolution or the core power. Later, we got that information from the reactor operator, and we were able to compare. So what we see here is detected antineutrinos per day on a linear scale, and then correlating that with the reactor power and also taking that data over some period of time. So this, this data comes between 2005 and 2006, uh, prior to the, uh, the new installation that we did later on, which actually never yielded good data. 
So if you look at the power that's provided by the operator, we can see that antineutrinos that is in red, uh, that's for the computational prediction, and then black is the experimental data with the air bars. It traces the power pretty well, but there are some abnormalities in that trace, right? First of all, we see that there is a decline in antineutrino count rate as a function of time. Why would that happen? And is that the degradation of the detector? No, it turns out that, uh, as I'll explain the neutrino physics later, that's related to decrease in uranium-235 in the core and increase in plutonium-239. So we correlate in the slope of the antineutrino count rate versus time with the presence of plutonium in the core. That's quite useful for safeguards data. The other thing that you may notice is there's a bit of a lag between the shutoff of the reactor and when we're able to see the shutoff. And that has to do with the size of the detector and the efficiency. So this is 100% related to the detector itself. So when we, see, when we say real-time data, we have to make a little bit of a um, sort of a footnote how real-time is the real-time. And that's one of the uh, optimizations that we do with our calculations. How soon can we tell what's going on in the core? And uh, how much of the material can be diverted before the, that slope will start being affected? And we actually know that this is happening. All right. So how do we relate antineutrino rate to the reactor parameter? You saw that they correlate quite closely, but not exactly one-to-one. And then there is a reason for that, is that parameter k is a function of t that we use. And the rate is a function of two things. The power of the reactor, which power means number of fissions. Number of fissions means how many isotopes have split, which means how many we produce that are too rich in neutrons will undergo beta minus decay, will give us the antineutrinos. But then there is also function k. Function k uh, measures... Uh, the number of antineutrinos released per fission, and that number changes as we go from uranium to the plutonium isotopes. So we can either measure the power using the uh, secondary side, and we can um, deduce what happens at the core, looking at the KT, or we can measure KT by approximation, our computational prediction, and understand the power of the reactor. So However, with the current detectors, we can't really know, we can't really be blind to both of these parameters. There is a way through the uncertainty analysis to uh, correlate the two, but it's, it's difficult. So, as I said, the reactant and neutrinos are uh, very sensitive to what's fissioned in the core. What we show here is four different isotopes that are the most common. They constitute 98% of the fissions in the core. Uranium-235, 238, 238 plutonium-239, and 241. And what we see here is the famous fission product yield as a function of the atomic mass. What does it mean for us? Well, the different products will yield different numbers of neutrinos with different energies. So depending on which nuclide undergoes fission, that will alter the reactor spectrum and also the neutron um, count rate, neutrino count rate, excuse me. So what are the numbers we're talking about? For a typical PWR type of reactor that we have in this country of 2,800 megawatt thermal, we're talking about five times 10 to the 20 antineutrinos per second. So when we relate the, uh, the large number to the very small cross-section, if you recall, this is one of the things that we always asked the cross-section of antineutrino interaction is very tiny. Keep in mind that this large number offsets that very small cross-section. So if you translate the antineutrinos that come from the core into the spectrum, as I said, that that's one of the ways to measure what happens in the core, there is a quite a bit of difference as well. Now, this is a log scale uh, that we have on the uh, y-axis versus energy of antineutrino. So if a detector is capable of measuring not only rate but also energy of antineutrino, we can uh, very fast determine what happens to the nuclear material in the core. And for the PMDA, that's the essential part. So as I said, the detecting of signal, 10 to the 20 antineutrinos per second, uh, what is the cross-section that we use most often? 
There are a number of different ways to detect antineutrinos, but the most common way is so-called IBD, inverse beta decay, that I had in the, the first slide of my talk. In inverse beta decay, antineutrino uh, interacts with a proton to produce two particles, a positron and a neutron, and we go after these two particles. So measuring the energy of positron and a neutron, we can get the energy of uh, antineutrino. And by looking at the count rate, uh, by relating the cross-section with the uh, Avogadro's number and the number of antineutrinos, that's the count rate. Gets us about 600 to 6,000 events per day, depending on the reactor, detector size, and also the position near the core. So as a result, when we, uh, uh, when we look at the flux and the cross-section, the observed antineutrino spectrum looks like something like this with the average energy of 4 MeV. And that shape will move up and down uh, and also to the left and right, depending on what isotope fission and at what energy of the reactor core. So using the antineutrinos to monitor the new exotic reactors could be quite different. As I said, there is a number of interests in the, uh, in the world and both in the US right now to look at the fast reactors. And the primary reason is the economics. The fast reactors can actually sustain very long fuel cycle. And the fuel cycle can go anywhere between 10 years all the way up to 60 years. Uh, I'm not saying this is feasible right now with the current materials, but it is feasible from the standpoint of nuclear material management. So if we can overcome somehow the problems with the structural materials from the reactor physics standpoint, that's not only feasible, it's desirable. So there are a few crazy ideas, as we call them now, but they... Very promising, there's been a number of um, uh, international groups built to look at these problems, is the candle type and onion type reactors. So those reactors are designed to go for about 30 to 60 years. From the economic standpoint, that's understandable, right? Once you load the core, you keep it there for 30 to 60 years. What about safeguards and other things? So one thing that, why we like this course from a safeguard standpoint, they propose to be part of the cassette type core, which means you supply to the country, you let them run out of juice in the core, and then you take it back, and then you deal with the material. Um, from the safeguard ability, that's a good idea. However, while you put that reactor in another country, how do you ensure that for the 30 years nothing happens? Now, current IAEA approach to uh, safeguards is to be at the reactor core during refueling only, which means when they take out the fuel and when they load the fuel back, the IA is present to monitor this activity. They are not at the reactors at any other time unless they're doing independent inspections. So what do you do with the reactors that are 30 years of their periodic inspections that you're going to do? There is no desire to open, and in order to open the reactor, you need to shut it down first, right, which takes it off the grid. There is no desire to open the reactor unless there is a need. So one way is to monitor what happens in the reactor core. And this, is, this example is for candle SFR. SFR stands for sodium fast reactor. And this is UCFR 1000 design, which Argo National Lab is a big part of that collaboration to design these reactors. So they actually work on both candle and onion. We worked with them to create a full, uh, full core simulation to understand how we can use the neutrinos to monitor what happens at the reactor core level. Let me tell you a little bit about this reactor. Uh, candle reactor operates with the principle that you load it with the, an ignitable material, for example, uranium-235, so fissile material. And then the rest of the core is fertile, which means as the fissile material burns out and produces neutrons, the fertile captures this excess neutrons and produces more fissile material and so on. This is why, from the reactor standpoint, we're able to run for 30 to 60 years. And this is why in the current light water reactors, the neutron economy is not very good, so we run for about 18 months to 24 months. So what happens in the reactor core? When we load the reactor, the, um, the propagation, actually, this is a little uh, unintuitive. We start from the top in this case, and you go down. The fresh fuel in this case means the fertile material that will absorb the neutron to produce more fissile fuel. So the active region of the core will move from top to bottom. 
If we look at the isotope fission rate, and this is a function of burn-up, uh, the reason I show burn-up is effectively the, um, the time, right? So this should be years, actually. I'm sorry, I meant to change this to years. So this is 60 years, not burn-up, but time of years. Um, if you look at our uranium-235, in the beginning of the core life, we rely on 235 100%, and then it drops down very fast because we burn out of it very fast. But we build up a lot of plutonium quite fast as well, and then we establish equilibrium after some period of time when the active region of the core moves. So if you look at the normalized power, now uh, this is our top right here, right? And at 400 centimeters, this is the bottom of the core. We see that the axial power also propagates from top to bottom, and it also spreads out as it moves with time. So now we're looking at the beginning of the cycle when we just loaded the core all the way to the 70 years, and this is the power profile evolution of the burn-up. So if you place three detectors, and they don't have to be the detectors that we use currently, those big bulky one-ton detectors, but there's a number of other technologies that are underway uh, being investigated at places like uh, Lawrence Livermore and Los Alamos to miniaturize these detectors. So if we take three detectors and we place them at three different positions along the core, what will this detector see? And in our assumptions, those detectors were uh, about one ton, uh, but a different configuration than the Song's detector we had. And they were positioned about 15 meters away from the core. So they weren't really close to the core. They were outside of the actual vessel. So what we see with those detectors in terms of the neutrino rate evolution is quite interesting that the middle detector, once we reach the equilibrium, stays nearly constant. Remember that tail, it starts to spread out in the power and causes our middle detector to see fairly much the same neutrino rate. However, the response of the bottom detector and the top detector changes as the active region of the core moves. And comparing the response of the three different detectors, we're able to see that uh, there was actually nothing happening to the core throughout the observation of the fuel cycle, so there was no change in the power. There was no tampering with the core, neither axially nor radially. Uh, the biggest question still remains, and that's true for any antineutrino work, whether it's high energy physics or antineutrino work, or the reactor safeguards, is what do you do with those uncertainties? Because the uncertainties are still one of the major because of the unknowns that we have. We have a lot of work in progress that we've launched uh, with um, uh, Livermore and also the double show experiment past participants that are now in, in France and UK to work on uncertainties and look specifically on fast reactors. And there are really a number of dependencies that we have to evaluate. And number one is the reactor power output. It's measured right now with the accuracy to 2%, with the more modern techniques, we can measure it a little more accurate, but how much can we push it? Why is this important? That gives us the, the count rate, right, relating the power to the neutrino rate. Anti-neutrino yield data is one of the major sources of uncertainties to that date, and about 1% for the most common isotopes. However, it can go up to 10 to 20% for uranium-238, Uranium-238 is a very special isotope. The very first uh, experimental measurement of the yield was done about two years ago. So uh, until then, we had to rely on our prediction of the yield without actually seeing any experimental data. Detection reaction cross-section is another source of uncertainty, up to 1.5% right now. And uh, that will change with the more effective and efficient detectors. Uh, neutronics codes, that's a constant headache for us, is the, the nuclear data libraries for the neutronics codes, and that's not only a neutrino side, but also any time we need to calculate decay heat for the reactor operations or the actual um, uh, fuel burn-up. In nuclear energy, you would think that by now we would have those really great codes, but we still have a lot of uncertainty on what happens to the fuel in the core, and those codes bear a lot of that. Approximations made in the reactor model, uh, 
we have to approximate every time we model the reactor. And in our case, we use deterministic codes, which means we have to mesh the reactor core somehow. And depending on how large we select the reactor volume element to be, that bears another source of uncertainty. Uh, we could go to code like MCNP. However, uh, doing this type of uncertainty calculations we do with MCNP is not feasible, even on Lawrence Livermore clusters. All right, so one thing that we uh, start doing is designing uh, the methodology to evaluate the reactor uncertainties using deterministic codes. And we ironically utilize Monte Carlo approach to simulate uh, many different inputs to our code and to get the outputs and uh, evaluate the uncertainty based on the um, simple uh, covariance matrix of the output. And unfortunately, about 1,000 histories that we need to run to converge for that makes it very impractical to do uh, large numbers of calculations. But at the end of the day, when we did uh, most of the analysis in the covariance uh, matrix analysis, what did we determine? And the neutrino yield still remains one of the largest sources of uncertainty and more experiments are needed. So what we need to do next is to, well, first build a fast reactor and then measure the antineutrinos from that. So to conclude, uh, the reactors are here and they're here to stay and we are going to build more. And this is the position of the Department of Energy that we're not stopping to build in this country even after the break. We're going to build. We're going to build more. And it's most likely going to be an advanced reactor, most likely fast reactor. But another concern of uh, the community, both scientific and also Department of Energy, is the safeguardability of those reactors and non-proliferation. Because if we're going to lead the world into the new reactors, uh, which we are trying to do, how do we ensure that that doesn't fall in the wrong category of reactors. So we're trying to understand the uh, safeguardability of these reactors using antineutrinos without relying on uh, systems that are connected to the reactors. So we want to be the eyes and ears of the site, but we don't want to be there at all times because that's not practical. So antineutrino detectors may serve as that eyes and ear purpose without actually having to be physically connected to the plant in any way and have a potential to be spoofed. So as part of this study, we are doing the analysis of uncertainties because that's by far the biggest, um, the biggest hurdle that we have to overcome when it comes to the antineutrinos monitoring. I'll take questions now. <laughs> 